What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 218 at block height 628,775 on Sunday, May 3rd. Uh, sadly, it's just me and Janine today because Rick is getting ready for his first uh, government advisory uh, committee meeting. So uh, what's going on today, Janine? Uh, well, unfortunately, I have to tell everyone that apparently the uh, Scarfolk, Scarfolk Council of the Necromantic Trust has announced that the Wicker Man event is canceled this year, and they advise that you should sacrifice yourself in your own home and stay at least two meters away from other household members who are sacrificing themselves. Hmm. You know, I never really thought how all the weirdos are dealing with all of this. Hmm. Well, I saw someone say that the uh, the preppers are apparently disappointed that stuff hasn't shit the fan as hard as they thought yet. Oh it's kind God. of like kind of like the Bitcoin people who want a uh, fi who want a financial crisis just to prove that Bitcoin will be successful instead of saying, well, there probably will be a financial crisis, but we don't want one. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that tweet, and my first thought was, yeah, those people exist, but, like, no, that's not most preppers, you idiot. Um, people prepare for things that they don't want to happen so that they don't get fucked. That doesn't mean they want those things to happen. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, actually, actually, you know what random thing uh, I wanted to touch on before uh, we really dive into the stories today. So um, I didn't really touch on this in the last episode, even though I, I actually kind of wanted to cover this as like a real story, but it was just kind of too much up in the air and not really verifiable. But like all those rumors um, last week that Kim Jong-un um, died uh, after heart surgery and all the anime waifuing um, 4chan memes about his sister taking over and shit like that. And then um, two days ago, the, the footage claiming that Kim made his first public appearance since those rumors, um, you know, at a ribbon cutting ceremony for something opening. And first thing I see on uh, Tucker Carlson talking about that is is this footage real um is this fake and it's it's just amazing i think that this massive monumental watershed moment in history is playing out and i don't think most people realize it like we are having the first discussion in a geopolitical scope over whether information we have or not is like a deep fake is just completely fabricated like that's happening right now isn't that that's fucking good. crazy yeah and it's like that's going to be a weird exponential singularity like horizon like that's not like that's just going to keep happening more with more stuff that's not going to happen less and it's, it's just so weird to think that we're actually getting into that now, you know, despite it being obvious it, it was coming for years. Speaking of deep fakes, um, a few weeks ago, I found something that is one of the deepest fakes I've ever seen. And that is a website called this, I think it's called This Person Does Not Exist. And it's literally just a website that 
um, shows you images of people that look real, like there's nothing, there's nothing weird or extraordinary about them, but it generates images of people that apparently don't exist um, based on, you know, obviously it's using probably real photos of people, but then it's mashing around, you know, different aspects of, you know, their complexion and their facial structure and stuff to make new people that don't actually exist. And I thought it would be funny as a person who doesn't use actual photos of me anywhere to um, start using that website to generate my profile pictures and like, you know, going going through one picture every week or month or so of just, you know, a person that's randomly generated that doesn't actually exist from that website. Yeah, that thing is cool. And it's just, it's... It's really interesting. I think uh, one of the stories later in the show, I'll kind of circle back uh, to that site. I think it's uh, kind of loosely related, but yeah, it's it's like it's the, that whole notion of post truth, in the sense of being unable to verify things that you didn't witness yourself physically. Like that's not a meme. And like we're actually sliding into like you're going to viscerally see that more and more in the world events that that you pay attention to in your life. Alrighty. Also, wanted to say um, happy. Well, it was two two days ago now, but happy eighty seventh anniversary of Executive Order six one zero two, which was the one. Demanding that all citizens uh, surrender their gold to the U.S. government and Federal Reserve Bank. Woo! Fuck you, Roosevelt. Right before the happening. Alrighty, though. <sighs> I think there's going to be a lot of shinobi monologuing today because there's a decent amount of technical stuff to get into. Uh, so. I will try to make comments. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's just dive right into this. Um, so Matt Corallo uh, posted to the Lightning and Bitcoin dev mailing lists a potential attack against Lightning uh, payment atomicity that apparently is actually something um, that's been discussed a little bit um, among Lightning developers and was found at um, Square Crypto, actually, with Matt and some other people there just kind of um, talking about different things. And I want to say, first off, that this is a very nuanced attack that would be very complicated to pull off in practice. So this is not something that, that the vast majority of anybody really needs to worry about at all, um, statistically speaking. This is kind of, you know, like it, this, this could be exploited. This is something that, that we should mitigate and consider going forward in the long term. But it's not like a, oh my God, the sky is falling type issue. But it, it really comes down to the structure of an HTLC used to negotiate payments through the Lightning Network and interaction with the base uh, layer of the network on chain and kind of the differences between transactions propagating in the mempool versus something that's actually confirmed on chain and how different Lightning software um, actually um, you know, handles this. So pretty much the whole idea with the, the penalty construct of preventing theft in Lightning Network is that an honest participant will be able to see something um, that they should penalize and then react to that. And kind of the assumption here is, you know, you see it actually get confirmed in a block on chain and that's when you know, things matter, the, the, the timer starts ticking and you have to respond to it. Um, and it's all mostly centered around looking at what's actually confirmed in a block. Well, see, the issue is there um, with an HTLC that's, um, 
you know, in, in the process right now, um, that's still running, they use a CLTV time lock, which is an absolute height. And so it's not something that just starts ticking when something is confirmed in, in the block. Um, it's actually ticking the minute it's created. And the problem this creates is, is this weird kind of attack where somebody could drop to chain an old commitment transaction that has an active HTLC um, spending from it and just very low ball the fee, like put a ridiculously low fee so that it takes a long time to confirm and submit that into the mempool. And see the, the trick here is now the honest uh, party on the other side of that channel, unless they're watching the mempool, won't see that that transaction got submitted to the Bitcoin network. And, you know, eventually if let's say the malicious party was receiving the payment on the pre-image side of the HTLC and the honest participant should be able to claim the refund half before they can um, submit a pre-image, um, then pretty much um, that can just sit in the mempool. I'm sorry, I re re reversed that. Um, the, the malicious party can try and spend a refund when the HTLC should be going to the person who actually had um, the, the pre-image. So reverse that, sorry. Um, but the, the idea is that that can sit in the mempool unnoticed until the CLTV um, time lock is expired. And then when it confirms, um, they can just um, spend the refund transaction. Um, and there's a, a race now between that and the pre-image claim transaction because the time lock expired while it just sat in the mempool. And so um, this also has some issues too because, you know, a mempool is not going to, um, in most circumstances, accept a transaction that is spending um, an input in a different transaction in a conflicting way in most situations. Like that's why we have RBF um, to specifically flag like, yes, do replace this. And so you can actually even prevent a, a penalty transaction in this situation from even propagating through the network. Because if, if a, a conflicting transaction to that penalty transaction is in the mempool, um, then that mempool will not accept um, the the penalty transaction, and so it's it's it kind of gets into this this weird issue where if um, a malicious party submits an old commitment transaction that has an HTLC output in it, um, you get these kind of weird fringe issues that can be manipulated um, in the mempool in in order to defraud somebody of that HTLC output. And so kind of, there's a couple ways that you could deal with this. Um, one obviously is just require that a lightning node has access to a mempool to watch that in real time, but that is a resource burden. Um, but the positive side of that though, is this issue isn't really something that a, a wallet's um, user just does somebody spending money is going to have to deal with this is something that is more concerning routing nodes who can kind of get caught in this situation constantly routing payments for other people and so it's not that much of a, a big resource increase and so that that could be a reasonable way to deal with it um there's also the idea that um you could try to kind of set up a an incentive to pay or beg for pre-image releases um, if you don't have a necessary pre-image um, to react to a malicious attack in this situation, um, or kind of keep an eye on the, the mempool indirectly. And then there's also, um, you know, adding a um, anchor output like was just added in the new LND release um, in the commitment transactions so that you can bump the fee. Um, but you know, this um, kind of has the issue of making that more expensive when it hits chain if it has to. And so like there's these different kind of ways you can deal with it. And it seems like a lot of the, the lightning developers um, seem to be looking more towards having an anchor output in the settlement transactions as well as the commitment transactions. 
Um, but you know, it's, it's really, this isn't something that could just widely easily be exploited at mass scale. It's a pretty complex, uh, roll the dice type thing. And it's just something, you know, it goes to show blind spots, uh, exist when you're building out a, a new complex system. You know, you just have to remember that and actually look for them and figure out ways to kind of account for that. Whew. All right. Shinobi monologue one done. Any response to me? Good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, next up is just kind of a real quick, um, announcement. Um, the LND 0.10 beta is actually released now, so you can kind of play around with all of that. Um, not really going to go into the, the features or what's in it because we covered that in uh, last week's episode. So if you didn't catch that, you can go give that a listen. But um, following right on LND's heels is a new release of C Lightning uh, 0.8.2. And this is actually pretty awesome too, uh, for two reasons, or actually, actually three, three if you like uh, different setups uh, as far as your own uh, Bitcoin software. So, C Lightning now supports um, receiving key send payments, um, so a, a payment without uh, generating an invoice for somebody. Um, actually sending them is coming soon, but you know, obviously the logic is um, other software supports that, so you might as well be able to receive it um, as quickly as possible. There's also a um, large channels uh, configuration flag, so LND is kind of getting rid of um, channel size limits uh, you can flag and run a lightning channel now with no restrictions on how much bitcoin is in it as long as the other um, channel counterparty supports that as well that is pretty cool um, as well um, experimental support for a proposal that um, blockstream and async have been collaborating on um, i didn't even know about this um, nor was I able to really find any kind of specific write up on it. Um, but basically the, the gist of it is, um, kind of blinding or, or hiding, um, the invoice data, the, the path to the node that you're paying, um, in the actual invoice. Um, and the, the idea is kind of, you know, even the person scanning the invoice does not know where that payment is ultimately going. And I think this is pretty awesome for two reasons, just the, the general privacy increase that this could create. But also, um, you know, Jack Mahler's has uh, the um, lightning strike um, that you can hook up um, to your bank account through your debit card and just have a a fiat wallet that can talk Bitcoin over lightning network and kind of a, an issue with that from a privacy point of view is, you know, strike the service is seeing all the details in all, um, lightning invoices that are paid using strike and something like this blinded, um, path proposal for invoicing would allow a service like strike to operate where they just never get any information on who their, their customers are paying or, or where, a, a, an HTLC is routing to over the lightning network. And they just never get that data. So like th this is simultaneously just a general privacy improvement for lightning. Um, if this gets flushed out properly and adopted, but it's also something that kind of fixes um, one of the privacy issues surrounding using centralized or custodial lightning tools, which I think is pretty awesome. <gasps> Alrighty. So um, yeah, that is the lightning uh, block of stuffs today. And uh, Janine, if you got nothing to, to add in on that, I think you are up on the next story. Yeah, so of course, this is a time of uh, much controversy and many bad decisions. But luckily, uh, there was one positive decision that came about recently. Um, you may have heard recently that there 
might have been the possible sale of the entire .org uh, registry, which would basically mean that if you want to register a .org website, you would have to go through a private uh, private equity company instead of the usual registrar that has been available. And um, I think was this, I think this was either today or yesterday, but um, I think it was actually yesterday, the uh, ICANN board announced um, that they were going to be rejecting that sale or the, the rather the transfer of control um, to the private company. They said today the ICANN board made the decision to reject the proposed change of control and entity conversion requests that the public interest reg uh, registry PIR submitted to ICANN. After completing extensive due diligence, the ICANN board finds that withholding consent of the transfer of PIR from the Internet Society or ISOC to Ethos Capital is reasonable and the right thing to do. ICANN's role is to ensure the stable and secure operation of the Internet's unique identifier systems. We are dedicated to making the right decision, knowing that whatever we decide will be well received by some and not by others. It is our responsibility to weigh all factors from the ICANN bylaws and policies perspective, including considering the global public interest. We have done this diligently, ensuring as much transparency as possible and welcoming input from stakeholders throughout. On November, uh, in November 2019, um, the Public Interest Registry announced that um, ISOC, its parent organization, had reached an agreement with Ethos Capital under which Ethos Capital would acquire uh, the Public Interest Registry and all of its assets from ISOC under the agreement PIR would also be converted from a Pennsylvania not-for-profit corporation to a for-profit Pennsylvania limited liability company. ISOC created and agreed to the transaction details that are under review. Um, but per the uh, generic top-level domain registry agreements, I can can or I can must either approve or withhold consent of a proposed change of control, and the deadline of which is uh, May fourth. So they basically came to a decision right before the deadline, and they have decided to reject that uh, proposal. So that is good news in the land of, hey, it might be a good idea to not have a uh, American corporation controlling the registration of .org domains. Mm -hmm. You know, th this is one of those few non-financial things that I do think there is some kind of logic to piggybacking on proof of work or or cryptographic or blockchain based system and like this is exactly the the kind of reason why it's it's like the phone book of the internet and you know i think that the the agencies and the institutions kind of managing all of those systems and protocols and namespaces could be doing insanely worse um, but it's, it's like, it's, a, it's just an entity that's made of people and those people change and different individuals influence on things change. And it's the, this is the kind of stuff that makes me nervous about just having people consciously in charge of systems like that is what if they hadn't, um, gone, you know what, this is going to have bad consequences. Um, we're negating this. What if they just let this go through? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, because so far, I mean, there's been, I mean, yeah, everything could be better in terms of the governance structure of all this, but I definitely don't think that, because, like, I have nothing against, you know, for-profit entities having control of stuff, but what like the legal uh implications of having a for-profit company con having control of this is very uh concerning because obviously when you have a for-profit company like the reason it's called for-profit is because they basically they make a pledge to you know whoever is investing in the company whoever's part of the company that they are going to do business for the purpose of profit and if they don't make profit or they do anything that knowingly goes against that 
they can actually get in trouble. Um, and that is not a situation that you would want to have for a for an entity that is responsible for registering uh, domains, um, especially when you know they're going to be registering domains for other countries, and there's going to there could be geopolitical stuff going on there. Like you don't you don't want that involved in this. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And yeah. I mean, I'm I'm sure some people might have done some background digging on Ethos Capital. I didn't, um, but that would probably be my foremost thing to look into if this had actually gone through, because you not only have the jurisdictional risks of you know it's a for-profit company in the U.S. But you have, you know, what is the, what are the goals of the company itself and what types of organizations might they try to censor? Um, that would not be, that would not be a good thing. Mm-hmm. It's a weird balancing act. And, you know, I think how this uh, new IP thing um, coming from Huawei eh, is going to really show that because you know how these things go like that's that's not done and over with that's going to keep popping back up and developing for like the next year or two Alrighty, i think i'm gonna slide along into continuing to rack up my block stream shill bonus checks today so swinging right back to block stream related news um <laughs> They've uh, pushed a new update for their uh, Blockstream Explorer um, and the Explora um, framework that it runs on. Um, some pretty cool stuff, man. Um, so first off, um, they brought back the light mode um, that they removed previously, um, which is designed to kind of run your own personal um, Explora instance um, locally on your machine. And the, the light mode pretty much just uh, strips out a lot of resource requirements by not building redundant um, databases itself and just querying um, your actual nodes database for block or transaction information. And it's, it's a lot slower, obviously, um, than running an indexed uh, secondary database. But if you are trying to actually use this stack privately on your own machine, um, that is not a two thousand dollar high end gaming PC. Um, you know, it's a pretty useful feature. As well, they have a new API endpoint uh, for raw block hash um, data, as well as a lot of data about um, what's in the blocks. Um, and to kind of wrap back around to the the new C Lightning version. Um, this is kind of a double update to both of these so that C Lightning um, can actually just directly connect to an Explora instance to gather block data um, for operating on the Lightning Network. And now this is really cool. Um, although big caveat um, directly out of their post on this, um, connecting C Lightning to Explora as opposed to directly to a Bitcoin node introduces um, trust there. Like you are no longer just directly getting data from a node. Um, it's being filtered through something. So obviously if you're using Blockstream's instance of Explora, um, you are trusting them not to withhold data or, or lie to you and so on. Um, but you can also just run your own Explora instance. And I think like, Mostly the, the utility here is, isn't for end users. It's, it's more people running um, routing nodes or, or nodes that they're running services or products on top of and just kind of having more flexibility for what you can hook that up to and the different resource costs of that. But that said, you know, I think it's inevitable eventually that this gets used for something consumer facing. And there's no getting around that it introduces trust in that way if you are not running every aspect of the stack yourself. But I am kind of interested in seeing how much you can improve the, the privacy model by building out and tweaking this API a little bit um, to be able to query information based on different data points that might not reveal 
say like the the whole transaction you're looking for unless that transaction is actually in the mempool or a block or something. And I, I think it would be interesting, like how much can you improve the privacy of some consumer lightning app using this, um, even though there, there's still an element of trust in that. And then also they have redone a decent amount of the um, liquid facing side of Explora. So there's now a clear um, peg in, peg out page so that you can easily find and look at statistics about how much Bitcoin is entering or leaving the liquid network at any given time. And they made a few tweaks to the GUI in terms of specifically, like let's say you're looking at a transaction on an address page, it will highlight um, the actual outputs in individual transactions that are going to that address. Um, and they have permanently um, hard-coded the date formats to international um, instead of being locale dependent. So Americans are going to get confused when looking at dates on this. Um, so yeah, overall, I um, think there's some pretty cool interplay with Sea Lightning going on here. And I'm pretty psyched that Light Mode is back uh, so people can actually run their own private uh, block explorer uh, and not leak private information using ones on the internet. Woo. Whew. All right, last little block stream bonus, just a quick update. Um, elements 0.18.1.7 has released. And it seems like they're kind of folding um, liquid and elements into kind of a single code base and daemon. Um, they've tweaked the, the GUI um, to elements. Um, support estimation for um, less than one sat per byte fees um, like was pushed um, in liquid proper and just a, a few little tweaks i think really the most important one is apparently there was a, a bug where if you were issuing an asset on liquid and were issuing it to an invalid address um, it would kind of fail and move um, that into a fee output. Um, so it's just uh, kind of fix that and the transaction will just completely fail um, rather than tweaking it in the construction process if the address is invalid. So, woo, that is Blockstream for the day. And I think that puts us back to you, Jenny. Blockstream Digest out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the next story is about uh, more COVID-19 and contract tracing stuff, which we've been talking a lot about. And um, basically, a citizen lab researcher named John Scott Railton uh, tweeted a very long thread about some work in advertising that NSO Group has been doing regarding contract contact tracing. For anyone who doesn't know who NSO Group is, they're a Israeli offensive spyware company which has been accused of licensing their Pegasus tool to the Saudi government, which then used it to spy on at least two Saudi dissidents, uh, one of which was Jamal Khashoggi, who was then brutally murdered. Um, WhatsApp has also sued them for allegedly hacking uh, roughly 1,000 one and a half thousand users um and that's still ongoing which is actually very relevant to uh the contact tracing stuff um which i'll get to but uh railton says that nso group is marketing covid19 tracking in the u.s according to nbc nightly news uh i assembled as many screenshots of the product that i could find from their demos looks like they use targets to refer to civilians guess this is expected from a spyware company uh, end quote. He then goes on to argue that their data appears to be rather imprecise location wise. He actually looked up uh, he actually looked up one of the examples, uh, which, you know, most likely was supposed to be locating someone that was probably driving down a highway, but it instead put them in a rather uh, weedy looking, deserted, you know, uh, patch of dirt next to the highway uh, and so most likely they're using cell carrier data and not anything more precise than that which is 
going to be really important going forward if they actually get contracted to do any contact tracing because unless you do have super precise data, unfortunately, you can't actually assume that people have come into meaningful contact with each other to warrant claims that they've been exposed and then notifying them of that fact. Um, because obviously if you're driving down the highway and you get within 10, I don't know, 10, 20 feet of another person, yes, technically you were 10, 20 feet away from a person who may have been infected, but you're in cars and you're driving down the highway. Obviously that's not comparable um, at all. So uh, he continues, when you're working with data with this much built-in inaccuracy, it would be pretty intense to issue alerts each time this happened or to require quarantines or testing. The rates of false positives here would be through the roof, um, but so would false negatives. Um, and so the reason the ongoing legal action with WhatsApp is important to this is because it shows that they are willing to kind of mislead about the utility of their products and also um, they cannot be trusted with sensitive information. So he mentions in the thread, NSO claimed that they cannot see who is being tracked with Fleming, which I think is the name of this offshoot of their surveillance software that they've been marketing for contact tracing. He says, so relax, guys, right? They should, uh, or they said the same thing about Pegasus spyware, yet legal filings from WhatsApp this week showed that NSO could easily monitor customers' targeting. Um, and so after I saw this thread, I went to check whether uh, our favorite other spyware company, Hacking Team, um, or rather their spinoff companies, have made similar moves to use this pandemic to market their surveillance software. And I haven't checked... Uh, I think there was one more that kind of spun up in the UK that was, I think it was being led by their former product manager or marketing person. I'm not sure I haven't checked on that one, but the main one that came with the uh, very, very interesting and not, uh, not very ethical CEO was uh, Memento Labs in Italy. And I haven't seen anything yet to indicate that they have um, done any work on contact tracing, but it wouldn't surprise me because they are from Italy and Italy is one of the epicenters. And so that's why I said on Twitter that people should keep an eye on them. Um, just to be clear, Mementos Labs is the, it's another Italian spyware company that acquired the remains of hacking team in the last couple of years. And it was reported at the end of March that they were struggling due to, quote, continued fallout of the demise of hacking team. That was according to, I think, a motherboard article. Um, so in that case, you know, if they're struggling financially, and I think they also lost a bunch of developers, it wouldn't surprise me if they attempted to use the pandemic to, you know, take on a new initiative to prop up their still failing business. So I think that's important to look out for. Oh my God. I just could not stop thinking about like all the stupid ways that that could just go wrong based on cell phone data. Like, oh my God, just like a blind spot, like really far away from all the towers around it in the middle where the distance isn't going to be accurate like anybody in this square block you're infected now because some infected guy was here or like a, a cell tower out in the middle of nowhere where there's not a dense enough coverage to really triangulate and it's just like okay so how does this work here it just measures radius um so there was an infected guy in this band radius 50 meters away from the cell tower. Everybody 50 meters away from the cell tower has corona. It's just like, that is the stupidest source of data imaginable to be trying to apply to something like that. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, the, the weird thing is that, you know, they're using a bad source to begin with, but then in the interface itself, it was representing it at a much more precise level. It was literally down to like, I think... It was like meters, like individual meters or even fractions of meters. Like, so they're yeah, represent that was yeah. real fringe cases I just went through, but it's like it, they would happen somewhere. Yeah, but the, the point is like it's not very clear whether the 
you know, the precision, the precision that they're showing off in the interface is actually representative of the precision of the data that they have, or if they're just making it that way to, you know, look better. Um, but also the more important thing is that they can't be trusted with this sensitive information because they were saying, oh, we can't see, we can't see the, you know, individual names. It's anonymized. Like all of them try to claim that they've anonymized the data. And then that turns out to not be true. They're just a bunch of liars. And the WhatsApp lawsuit is showing that in that case, uh, where they've been claiming this whole time that they weren't, you know, they had no involvement with that. So you can't trust these people. I mean, there's already a huge hazard. There's a huge potential for the data to be misused by companies that, you know, you know, I don't trust like Google and Apple, whatever, where I don't trust them. I don't generally trust them, but at least they're not, you know, their main, their main operation is not necessarily spyware and hacking people and getting people killed. Yeah, you know, I th I think this kind of slides pretty well into the next one too. Um, so I saw Matt Odell tweet about this actually, but um, there is uh, coverage in Indian uh, media now that the Indian government is making um, contact tracing apps mandatory um, for all public and private sector employees. And that the employers are entirely responsible for guaranteeing 100% compliance with the, the use of these apps. Um, and they're saying, don't worry, um, there's no privacy concerns because all of the data is anonymous. But then they're telling members of the Indian military to only activate location services and Bluetooth while visiting public places or when on COVID-19 related civil assistance. They have also been told not to disclose their service identity, their rank, the fact that they are in the military or any other users or people that they know and have been advised to keep their um, phone operating systems completely up to date and actively install antivirus software while using this app. Um, so those two statements are completely contradictory of each other. Why do members of the military have to take all of these extra digital hygiene steps to protect their information while using this app if there's no privacy concerns because all the data is anonymized? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, 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 I saw a few, I'm not even sure if they are real Indian people, but I saw some comments from people claiming to be Indians that it wasn't mandatory. Has that, de has it definitely been confirmed that this was a mandatory thing? Yeah, um, that pretty much boiled down to he was not aware that it was made mandatory yet. And then he just started arguing about how it doesn't matter and he won't install it. So yeah, to me, that, that just seems like um, somebody... Um, yeah, that, that seems to me like one of those cases where commenting about something bad happening in a country is seen as like a critique of the people of that country rather than the government. You know what I mean? It's kind of how I, I read that interaction. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, um, yeah, this I think is all you need to see to know that these claims that all of this is totally anonymous and private are complete horseshit. Because when they tell the public one thing and they tell members of their own military another thing, um, it's the thing they're telling the members of their military that's the truth. Yeah, because obviously they wouldn't want, you know, whoever is running the service or the app and collecting the data from it. Um, I mean, unless the government themselves, maybe even if the government themselves is doing it, they don't necessarily want the movements of their military being tracked by, you know, or they don't want that data, ex you know, easily accessible in that way. So yeah, if, <laughs> if they're, if they're warning them about that, then that's definitely not, <laughs> that, that's definitely a red flag. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So what do we got up next?
just a brief announcement, right? Yeah, just this is a brief PSA for um, something Shinobi found. Um, I'm not familiar with these products, so I don't know how big a deal of it is, at least for our audience. But um, there is it pronounced Xiaomi? I believe so. Um, so Xiaomi, maybe it's Xiaomi. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying Xiaomi. Um, Basically, it's an electronics company based out of Beijing, um, but they also do distribution outside of China. Like I, when I was briefly looking them up, I saw a center in Miami, for instance. And basically, a security researcher recently found that um, Xiaomi records all the search queries and items viewed on its default browser, which is called Mi Browser Pro, as well as the Mint Browser. Uh, the tracking extends to incognito mode as well. The researcher was able to confirm the same pattern on other Xiaomi phones, including Mi 10, Redmi K20, and Mi, Mi Mix 3. Um, and actually, the company, they were asked for comment, and they confirmed that it collects browsing data. However, the company says that the data sent is anonymized, and the users have consented to data tracking. Oh, goody. I love these two. Yeah, Kitty Kitty likes it too. Kitty likes these excuses um, that match uh, with the bullshit from the other stories where they say the data is anonymized. Yes, I bet it is. Um, but if anyone knows anything about, you know, projects and companies that claim data is anonymized, um, if you actually look into the way in which they try to anonymize the data, it's usually bullshit. And there are so many papers about how here's how we re here's how we re-identified your anonymized data very easily. Um, so saying it's anonymized doesn't mean anything. You have to actually look into how they do that. And most of the time when companies claim that it's not actually effective. Also, users consenting to data tracking, um, if that's just a, oh, they clicked accept on the terms and conditions, uh, that was super long and nobody reads, um, yeah, sure, they consented to that. Um, but as we've seen with the conversation around, you know, the, you know, rec more recent European regulations about what consent actually means and how effective is it and can you actually say that users consented to X? Um, yeah, most of the time that is also bullshit. So just be aware in case you use any of these products that this has been happening. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought this was kind of important to touch on for the same reason, like all the, the Zoom stuff. You know, <laughs> it's like... This to me, it's just it's it's digital espionage. Like this, this is Chinese digital espionage, and it's something that people should be aware of if they use these devices. But just in general, like I think right now, like people are so concerned about their own governments surveilling and tracking them that they just forget about other countries and other governments. And I think it's important to keep in perspective right now during all of this, like it's not just your government that is going to be trying to spy on you right now. It's every government. Everybody is going to be trying to spy on everybody else they can right now because so much of our social interactions have moved to the digital realm that you're you're an idiot if you don't try to take advantage of that situation from a geopolitical or geopolitical point of view and so it's like just that's an important thing to remember like if you live in america it's not just america that's trying to spy on you if you live in germany it's not just germany trying to spy on you like it, it's not that clear cut and the issues that you should concern yourself with if you value your privacy are not that simple all right, real quick, Janine, um, I think I'm going to go run to the bathroom super quick. I got to pee, and this next one's going to be a long one. Yeah, I actually, I was about to say something, but I didn't have the window uh, selected. So um, so while you're gone, I'm just going to say that, um, yeah, the, actually, the if, what we learned from the Snowden leaks um, is that actually the primary way that companies, uh, at least in a lot of Western countries, the primary way that a lot of Western countries spy on their own citizens is actually via the surveillance that's being done by other countries or in or through other countries. That's what the whole five eyes and 14 eyes thing is about. 
It's about countries having data sharing agreements between each other so that, hey, you know, our domestic laws don't allow us to spy as much on our own citizens as much as we'd like in this instance. So could you please, you know, kind of surveil this person for us and then, you know, share that data with us somehow and we'll do the same thing for you whenever that comes up. I mean, that was that's what that's what all of those agreements are about. It's like the be the best way for all, at least the US government, European countries, um Australia, New Zealand, a lot of them, the the best way that they spy on their own citizens is to ask other governments to do it for them so that they can ignore domestic privacy laws. And unfortunately, that still continues many years after the Snowden leaks because, yeah, I mean, worry worry about your own government, worry about other governments, and then worry about the fact that they're collaborating to spy on you because at the end of the day, they're all the same. All right, I think I had perfect timing getting back. And I... Hopefully, think I got the gist of what you uh, what you said, um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah they will funnel things through other countries' infrastructure or services because legal excuse suckers. Did I get that right? Is that in context? Yes. Uh, yes. Alrighty. So this next one is going to be kind of kind of long. Oh dear. All right. <laughs> So Samurai released a, a new report through OXT Research on the Lazarus Group, um, the North Korean um, connected entity that has been going on a little bit of a crypto hacking spree in the last few years. And I do want to say, first off, um, I have only read the preview of the report and then a lot of the source documents that it pulled from. And after getting that far into things, um, I am not paying $100 for a report, um, and I'll get to why in a second, um, that from what I can see probably does not add much uh, information beyond the source materials. So the gist of this is on March 2nd, um, the Department of Justice um, pretty much filed an indictment against two Chinese nationals who they had tied to the Lazarus group in an ongoing blockchain uh, analysis investigation of a lot of these hacked coins from South Korean exchanges. And really the, the big thing I want to point out here is that one, it seems like a lot of this, um, hacking activity and theft was more motivated. Mm, how do I put this? Um, I, I'm not saying that North Korea does not have any Bitcoin or crypto stockpiled, but it seems like the structure of this operation and where most of the proceeds went um, tended to funnel out into fiat. Um, and most of the entire operation seems to be structured chiefly to get the crypto eventually liquidated into fiat and laundered into different international um, legacy accounts over the world. And a big part of this is, I think, you know, to do with North Korea's funding of, of black budget stuff internationally, but also funding its weapons of mass destruction program. And pretty much the gist of this is, you know, and part of the, the report preview and some of the reports looked at some of these funds going through Wasabi and as usual, um, started screaming about how this is fundamental um, flaws in the Wasabi mixer being illustrated. And I'm just going to say right now, um, no, it's not. It is the exact same thing um, that has been the case almost every time they they make these claims, um, looking at big flows of funds moving through Wasabi. Um, when somebody uses a mixer and then condenses all of those mixed coins at the other end of it, that is not a flaw with the mixer. That is post-spend behavior. That is users making bad decisions that can be made with literally any mixing protocol out there. And so it's really like just stop being children 
and make adult critiques. Like most of this entire money laundering operation was based on self-constructed peeling chains and washing first through low tiered um, KYC light or no KYC exchanges to obscure uh, the source of funds. And then another layer of peeling things into more strict KYC exchanges to eventually dump for fiat. And most of the operation seems to be kind of structured, not in terms of getting, you know, permanent actual privacy for all of these coins, but just obscuring the source of these funds long enough um, that they can actually get them dumped for fiat and wired to a bank somewhere before things start getting put together. And a large sum of this money actually um, was successfully cashed out in that way. And, you know, it's kind of like, I just want to get around to two main points here out of all of this. Like one, um, th this group using Wasabi does not illustrate a fundamental flaw in Wasabi. The, the condensing outputs at the other end of mixing is what gave the, the fingerprints and the patterns to put this all together. Um, a, a, an actual critique of a flaw in Wasabi would be the fee structure leading to each round having a different output denomination slightly. That's an actual flaw in this. Um, again, I haven't actually read the whole report. I'm not paying $100 for something that seems like the majority of the information is in freely available source documents. Um, but I have seen nothing that said or showed that that aspect of Wasabi is what led to de-anonymizing this whole chain of transactions. It was the condensing outputs after mixing, which can happen with literally any mixing software out there. And two, that this kind of meme of like North Korea being like some super rich, you know, Bitcoin hodl um, nightmare state in the 21st century. I think this is, it's kind of showing that that is a meme. You know, like the, the, the chain activity for a lot of this stuff shows some things still sitting in Bitcoin, like not 100% of all this money was cashed out into fiat, but the lion's share of it was. And so that shows that priority wise right now, you know, North Korea isn't just stocking Bitcoin to hodl. Um, they're stealing Bitcoin to get fiat revenues to fund government operations. And so I think that's kind of a big important thing to, to take away given the, the years of, of memeing about what is North Korea doing with all this Bitcoin they're stealing. So while you were talking, I was just having an air uh, cat slap fight with my cat where literally we weren't touching each other but she was trying to hit me and so i was air hitting her back <laughs> and that that is uh yeah i have enough cat fights here i don't need to get uh not interested in getting into cat fights on social media related to this but yeah interesting that you know because there's been so many Stories about how North Korea is stockpiling Bitcoin, and like you said, um, they could still be doing that, but at least in this case, they seem primarily motivated to send it through exchanges, which, you know, out of all the things they did, that is one of the things that's most likely to get them caught uh, in terms of, you know, figuring out where the coins came from and connecting it, um, exchanges are the biggest weak point. And yeah, sure, the mixing, it, whatever, you can analyze that and say some areas are problematic, but at the end of the day, if it's going through an exchange, that's probably going to be your biggest weakness. And that seems to have at least played a part here, um, in addition to, you know, post-mix behavior that was not smart. So... Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know, a little bit of the, the details I kind of want to go into with the operation now, because I kind of want to show how like a lot, like, yeah, you were able to follow all of this and put things together with blockchain analysis to a large degree. But th this case, I don't think would have been made or this picture painted so completely without all that other metadata. And it's, you know, some of the things that they were able to pull. Um, th these operatives were actually like registering um, KYC accounts with South Korean exchanges with like fake 
um, South Korean IDs and like actually um, digitally altering photos to have like multiple different fake accounts under these fake IDs. Um, and this is one of the, the pieces of data that tied things together. And they were also able to, um, like the, the amount of metadata they were able to scoop up with this, they were tracking through VPNs, um, you know, obviously are not going to, uh, put up a fight when somebody like the U S government comes knocking and the word North Korea gets said, um, but like the search histories. Like, you know, I, I don't know how familiar people are with system penetration listening, but like you do a lot of footprinting and, and research work, um, just figuring out how aspects of, of a, a specific system or piece of software or different companies procedures work. And they were able to tack or I mean, tag and track all of the, the footprint research that these people were doing in the process of actually compromising these exchanges. So th this is not just, you know, they, they found the exchange hack and tracked it to an IP and an account and this person, no, they're actually scooping up logs of the things they were searching on the internet to research this attack and accomplish it. And so it just, it really is incredibly important to realize like there is a lot more than just the on-chain privacy in terms of covering your ass with things. Because yeah, that was a lot to go on in a big part of this investigation, but also look at the depth and breadth of all kinds of other metadata that was correlated and tied to these individuals during this operation. Like it was not just the on-chain activity that that put this whole picture together and like even you know the the oxt research team and samurai themselves say that yeah and they might have even gone into more detail in the report i haven't seen the full thing either so i'm not going to you know make obviously not going to make conclusions about whether it was good or not based on the screenshots but yeah mm-hmm but you know, it's it's. Uh, I I really don't know what to to end this on, other than I wish the the childish bullshit would just stop because there is actually a lot of valuable information in here, aside from, you know, what what I assume is just the usual shit flinging at wasabi, and like you you are. I don't. Know, you're you're damaging the the credibility, the reach, the willingness to look at and be open-minded about that shit when you engage in other matters like a child yeah but right. as i as i said the last time we talked about this there are a lot of children involved and we should not be one of them oh i know this is probably going to make some people's heads explode because um in two stories i'm actually going to defend samurai um <laughs> so let, let, let's jump to the the next one um, Wasabi has merged, um, the, the first kind of implementation of pay to endpoint, um, that's compatible with the BTC pay spec. Um, so this is going to be hopefully in the next release of Wasabi. And it's also, obviously you can compile and start playing with this yourself. And also, um, in the show notes, um, for anybody who wants to go look through it, um, there is actually um, a link to the code in the GitHub repo that handles the, the kind of sanity um, tests and like safety checks for the PSBT implementation. And even if you are not um, you know, a programmer, can't read code, the, the comments in it are pretty clear. Um, like they run tests to make sure that the... Um, merchant server is actually adding their own um, new input um, that the amounts in the outputs properly uh, match giving the receiver their funds back as well as the exact payment amount um, that no games are being paid there um, a check to make sure that the, the server isn't maliciously trying to trick you into signing one of your own outputs um, that you did not want to involve in this transaction um, as well as a check for 
the server trying to kind of play games with the uh, change output and add that into itself um, and what they're receiving back. But, um, you know, it's a, you can go through and read the the comments, but this is, it's pretty much like all of the actual safety checks um, that Wasabi is going to be running when you use the pay to endpoint implementation. And I think this is probably one of the most important parts um, of pay to endpoint getting rolled out that everybody should kind of pay attention to, because this is an interactive, um, you know, process, just like lightning, um, even though it's different, the, the whole model and, um, you know, risk uh, model is, is very different. It's still an interactive process like that. And so there are things you have to make sure in terms of privacy um, are not being exploited against you. Things um, are not being exploited against you to trick your wallet into signing transactions you don't want to. And I think all the, the details of that are really going to be the important part of this that kind of gets worked out, maybe is modified or better ways are brought into to handle different issues over time. And so, you know, kind of run through that and, and look at that because it's the little details with something like that that really make the difference as far as like what kind of new risks or, or attack surfaces are opened up here. All righty. Let's make some heads explode. So, um, a guy, Leo Wandersleb, on Twitter, um, I think it's about a week or so ago now, um, got into a thread and started calling out Samurai um, for the fact that the code in their GitHub repo does not match the application being distributed in the Google Play Store. And he actually said that there are a few thousand lines of, of code uh, of difference here between what's in the actual repo and you know the, the application being distributed uh, through Google. And so there's a couple things I wanna say here. Um, first of all, they had to remove their feature that allowed you to hide the app launcher icon and access the wallet through the phone dialer because of uh, restrictions that Google added in terms of how apps on the Play Store can use the Android API. And these are features that they still include in the APK release um, that they put out outside of the Google Play Store. And so right here, like I, I, I don't really have any kind of frame of reference for how many lines of code um, in terms of difference and changes that is. Um, and Leo also said that there were other things um, in terms of differences. But I do just kind of want to point out like that's a potential reason for part of those differences. And it was very publicly explained. Um, there, there is no screaming conspiracy theory here to my eyes um there is a partial explanation and now the reason i say partial is because you know leo in um kind of talking to him for a little bit said there were other differences and that's a lot of lines of code of difference for a single feature like that but the thing i kind of want to point out with that that continued skepticism directed solely against samurai is Leo actually put out um, a kind of breakdown of all the mobile wallets out there he's looked at who similarly do not, um, you know, have a perfect match between the code in their repo and the code that actually goes into the application in the Play Store. And pretty much every mobile wallet out there for the, the most part, like the only one I, I think matches not the top of my head is Blockstream Green. Um, so this is not just, ooh, Samurai is being shady. or like This is actually a widespread problem with most of the fucking wallets in the space. And so like what I'm saying here is not just to Samurai. It's not me trying to single them out. but and I also do think that there are perfectly reasonable explanations here in terms of 
how much time and manpower they have available. Like, I don't think that this difference is like they're putting shady shit in the wallet to fuck you, but it still undermines the entire security model of using software in this space. Like the, the entire notion of, of how open source benefits non-technical people who can't code or can't audit code themselves is that a bunch of people can and they're all auditing it. So what winds up in your pocket has all of those eyes on it. And if the code in a repo that all of those people are looking over does not match the actual software that everybody else is downloading, then that argument is nonsense. Like the, all of those people going through the code on GitHub and auditing things, that does no good if there is a bunch of code going into the application people are downloading that does not match what they're auditing. Like that whole model just collapses on itself. And again, like this is not just samurai. This is not me singling them out or going, fuck you guys. Um, this is widespread in almost all of the wallets that Leo has looked at. And I think everybody in this space who, who has a project in that state needs to think about that and really try to whip that into shape so that there are not those inconsistencies because that is lit. Those two things matching exactly is the entire basis of why all the nerds combing through GitHub auditing things all day um, does anything to benefit other non-technical people out there who aren't building something from source themselves. Whew. Alrighty. So we want to dwell on this one for a second or jump to the next one. Yeah, I was just trying to find because um, I can't remember which episode it was that we talked about Google making that policy change where they had to remove those features. But if you want to know more about that, I did a presentation at BTC 2019 that um, some of the slides, I think, included links to those features being disabled. And it really sucked that those had to be removed because um like for example the they they were basically like sim swapping protection and also snooping protection like the if one of them if someone looks over your shoulder and you're you know you just have your phone open on the home page they can't tell that you have a bitcoin wallet on the phone unless you specifically you know enter a pin to make it appear um so that's just useful you know when you're going around to normie locations and you don't want people to see a bitcoin app show up on your phone when you're using it and then the other one was um sim swap protection really useful like even if even if you weren't using samurai for bitcoin you could potentially tell people to use that just to prevent sim swapping without having any bitcoin in the wallet um so it's really unfortunate that google did that um although they tend to you know enact policy changes like that um, for rather arbitrary reasons. And I think Samurai even applied to be um, exempt from that decision and they they didn't decide to make an exemption, which sucks. And they've also done stuff like that against actual competitors or things that would impact their surveillance advertising model. Like, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there was a browser plugin that um, it was an ad blocker, but it not only blocked ads, it also clicked on every single ad that it could find at the same time, which is funny because, you know, if you're just clicking every ad um, at the same time as blocking it, you're not seeing the ads, but all the advertisers are getting this like fake data of people that have looked at their ads. So yeah, Google sucks. Mm -hmm. And you know, that that I'd say that feature, the, the pin dial um, for the, the launcher hider, that was way more useful than just shoulder surfing. I mean, if, if you use that feature, um, there is no way to find that wallet unless you actually connect to that phone and analyze it forensically, or you already know it's there and what the pin is. So like even in a very serious situation, like you are fleeing a country for your life and can't get through the airport without anything that's ob or like with anything that's obvious, nine out of 10 times that will get you through because somebody's just going to grab your phone, look through it, and that's it. 
Like they're not forensically analyzing the phone of every single person that goes through customs. Yeah. So like that, that really pissed me off because that, that one was not like a, uh, a little useful feature. Like that was something that if they didn't keep it in the APK and available elsewhere, like that literally could be like, well, somebody can't get their life savings out of a deadly situation with them because of that. Mm -hmm. All righty though. On to things to call stupid. Yay. So there is this new hardware wallet um, that seems to be flying around everywhere um, with all kinds of podcast and media endorsements and, and what obviously look like paid appearances all over the place. Um, and, you know, some people have finally had the chance to dig through this. Um, I'm going to say first, don't ever fucking buy or use this thing. Holy shit. And I'm going to explain why now. Um, this is closed source. Period. Um, and at least Ledger, you know, is a arguably trustworthy entity with <laughs> much more <laughs> openness, relatively speaking, and much higher standards for checking things themselves that they sell that are closed source. Um, this company literally outsourced um, <laughs> the, the fucking uh, manufacturing and design of this. Um, the, it can only be used with a, a smartphone app. It's like an air-gapped device um, with a oh, QR code God. scanner and a touch screen. Um, the smartphone app is closed source. Um, and again, I want to I want to reiterate this: the hardware design and manufacturing was outsourced to a third party vendor in China, and they use a unknown Chinese secure element with no documentation in English. That actually, and it it does not use this for the Bitcoin. Um, like operations, but that element supports like some weird Chinese government crypto curve. So that is um, a lot of questions in my mind, at least. Um, and yeah, um, a lot, like it, it's just shipping closed source binary blobs um, with a secure element with no non Mandarin documentation from a, an unknown Chinese vendor with support for a Chinese government crypto curve. And oh, yeah, um, they will not let users build um, and install their own firmware. Um, the device will only run firmware signed by Kobo's keys. So, yeah, um, this is holy shit like holy fucking shit do not use this this is one of the most reckless fucking like upstart hardware wallet companies i've seen since mcafee's i, I don't even fucking remember what the fuck it was called um old smartphone um that he calls a hardware wallet and just stay the fuck away from this thing like I like seriously, I'm looking at some of the the fucking podcasters and people in this space who just jumped on shilling this thing and having people on for interviews and recommending it. And wow, are you an irresponsible fucking moron? Like, is it like anybody who has recommended we get this a name device? Vlad Costillo, um, who's too good for Bitcoin magazine. Uh, but um, yeah, is somebody you should not listen to about anything in this space because they don't fucking understand what they're talking about. They don't look at anything they're talking about to fact check shit. And they're clearly more interested with lining their own pockets and getting attention than giving people honest and safe fucking advice and information. Well. 
All right, now to flip that around the other side, a uh, more responsible, you know, not idiotic hardware company in this space is dropping a new firmware update for the cold card. Brought to you by Cold Card Digest. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so this is actually a pretty cool update. Um, so first, um, the text uh, message signing function now supports um, signing for SegWit uh, pay to witness pub key hash addresses um, if you specify a derivation path for that. So that is pretty awesome. Um, it's not, you know, signing for weird pay to script hash things and stuff like that, but at least we can now um, sign regular legacy addresses and regular segwit addresses to prove address ownership for different things if you use a cold card um they have also um integrated a generic um json wallet file so um, right now um the cold card can export a wallet file for electrum and wasabi and um th this was actually uh craig raw on twitter um idea but it's pretty much just a generic file, not um, specifically set up for any um, individual wallet. And the idea is that, you know, any other wallet out there who wants to support uh, the cold card can just work around this generic file and pretty simply, um, you know, integrate that. You just get the information out of this and then put it in whatever format your, your wallet actually natively handles it in. And then... Another cool feature, um, there is a new um, tool to install and save a passphrase encrypted on an SD card um, so that you don't have to manually type in um, passphrases for wallets um, if you want to use them. And this is kind of cool in that it's... Um, it kind of creates a new key to encrypt it with um, that gets data from the master secret in the uh, the seed on the cold card and a hash of the serial number of the individual SD card um, that you put it on. And this is really cool um, because it's pretty safe in terms of normal attack vectors i mean like you know a really technical equipped person could get your sd card with that phrase on it copy um the sd card serial number and the encrypted file and then put that back so you don't notice it and if they were able to get your cold card or unlock it um to have the the master um secret from your word seed um, yeah, theoretically, they, they take that information and decrypt it again. But like realistically, um, that's not going to be something a person can do. So most people will be able to get that card, copy the file onto another SD card. And because they didn't get the serial number and they would still have to get your, your actual seed secret, um, that's just a useless file that they can never decrypt. And so, yeah. This is how you keep improving the security of things you use to manage um, your Bitcoin. Not using weird, random, undocumented um, Chinese secure elements that um, some third party company picked for you and loaded closed source firmware onto. Yeah, I mean, if you if you really wanted to be if you wanted to go cheap with your hardware wallet design, you could just, you know, get an underpaid intern to do it. You know, you don't have to go to China. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's, it's okay. Just to kind of wrap up both of, of these two stories. Um, this is just a weird issue in my mind. And it's something I've been kind of grappling with in my head for a couple years now, because like, just get real, like uh, coin kite, Trezor, Ledger, like Keep Key. I have problems with most of those companies, but I put them at a bar of like, these are actually doing something that's trying to not be bad or stupid. 
and those four companies are not going to fucking scale to provide hardware wallets to the whole world population that decides to use Bitcoin. Um, so there are going to be new companies, um, new products. But the problem is, is like, how do you, how do you encourage kind of smashing the garbage and the scams and the dangerous thing out of people's attention and bring those things that to some degree are doing it properly and safely to the forefront? Because if, if like everybody in this space can't figure out a way to at least nudge in that direction, then 10 years from now, um, that that is going to be a nightmare as far as what kind of idiotic insecure shit people are using to store their coins. Yeah, and I mean I don't I don't even know if I mentioned this before but I tried the keep key at the end of last year. I got like a bunch of free ones um from an event and well, you know, I wasn't paid and I don't have any sponsorship agreement so yeah, I tried to use that wallet and it was it was shit. I mean, the firmware update didn't work. I don't know why. Um, but I noticed that in the app, I hope this wasn't the reason, but in the app, like throughout the whole process of like setting it up, there was a bunch of prompts to like open a shapeshift account, which is like I know that shapeshift and keep key are kind of related. They're technically supposed to be separate companies, but they are kind of related. Um, but I found that to be really shitty because basically the implication that I got from the wallet, whether or not it was true, I don't know. But the implication I got is that in order to use the wallet, you had to create a shapeshift account or like it was heavily encouraged to create a shapeshift account and then connect it to the keep key. And it's like, no, no, that's not going to happen. So I'm, yeah, on the, on the scale of like hardware wallets, I would trust. I mean, I hadn't used the keep key before that, but now it's definitely towards the bottom of the list in terms of just like, if you can't even get a firmware update to happen or there's some shifty stuff going on, I'm not interested. Yeah, and the sad thing is that's one of the good ones, air quote, like relatively speaking, compared to like all these no name, scary ass things out there that most of the people like us don't even pay attention to because I just zone that out the minute I see that as that's a scam. Yeah, I mean, if you have, if you have a significant, if you're, if someone is new to Bitcoin and you have a significant amount, you literally like, you should actually pay someone or I don't know, contact, there's, there's a bunch of people you don't pay and they probably wouldn't take money if you offered it. But there's a bunch of people you can reach out to, to ask like, which hardware wallet should I use? And they're not, if they even know about these scammy ones, they're they're definitely not going to recommend them. Like they're just, they're no names. They haven't been tested, especially like e even when you have hardware wallets or any wallet that's open source, if it's from a no name group of people that aren't, you know, the code isn't being looked at or whatever, there's not a lot of people checking it then you almost have a situation where it's like, okay, that's great. They open sourced it, but no one's actually checked it. So what, like there's, you need to actually validate whether it's safe to use. It's not enough to just open source it. So it's a bad idea in general to just, you know, oh, someone shilled this thing on a podcast. I've never heard of it before, but yeah, I'll put my life savings on it. That's not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, and I am bracing myself for my last rant of today. Whew. Alrighty, so there is a second um, Covenant Vault um, structure um, that got dropped to the mailing list. Um, and this is really cool. I'm probably about to butcher the living shit out of um, his name. But uh, this was designed by Kevin Loak as well as um, DeRossier. And I'm going to just pretend I did that perfectly. Um, 
so this is actually kind of building on Brian Bishop's design. Um, but the, the idea behind it is a vault for multiple participants. So Brian's entire design was kind of like a, a reactive watchtower based um, protocol, kind of like lightning based purely on pre-signed transactions. And the whole point of that was to kind of rate limit how quickly you can access um, cold storage without making it like a full hot wallet where you have to worry about the, the concerns there. So this would pretty much be building on that, that general idea, except the idea is that multiple parties can store all of their money together in a single UTXO on chain. And then rather the, the chain of transactions, um, being built around, you know, kind of only allowing so much money, um, to be spent at a time, it would be based around, um, you know, have everybody having this one UTXO that they can pull from with a pre-signed transaction structure that lets any member get just their money out, um, without the other parties having to actively participate um, with a small delay um, or just collaborate with everybody and spend things. And so pretty much you create kind of this vault output and then a unvault transaction um, that kind of spends the output to a branched script that is either the entire vault um, set up in N of N key, um, or after an X block time lock, a subset of the vault members and a co-signing server um, could sign off on this. And so the idea here is that you would kind of push your unvault transaction after you create a spending transaction that pulls your money out of that and submit that to kind of the watchtower that all of the, the members are running. And so now the watchtowers would see this unvault transaction hit chain and they would see that they were notified like this was going to happen. And we know about the spending transaction that the one member is using to take their money out. And so we just let it happen. But if a member had not created the spend transaction to pull their funds out of it right away, um, the watchtower would automatically submit a, a kind of penalty, air quote, um, transaction that immediately sent it back into the vault uh, because that path has no time lock. And so kind of the idea is, you know, this reactive system where as long as you, you go, I'm taking my money out and you tell them first so that the watchtower sees that and then do the unvaulting, um, you know, it, nobody's watchtower sends anything back to the vault and you get your money out and blah, blah, blah. But if you didn't, you know, then somebody's watchtower would react, send everything back to the vault. And it's kind of just this automated process um, so that you can have each member pull their own money out if they want. And it's just this automated protocol watching it rather than, you know, a, an actual person having to get involved every time money was pulled out. And, you know, a big part of the design um, is obviously there's no way um, to kind of have a recourse um, of the N of N here. So like it is possible for one member of this to be a jackass and just keep sending shit back to the vault and never actually let anything get out of it. And so this whole vault design isn't really for people trying to use Bitcoin self-sovereignly. This is for businesses. You know, this is for some kind of entity that has some recourse or thing they can do outside of Bitcoin to deal with a situation like that. And I think this is going to be incredibly useful going forward for custodial things, um, just because depending on how the, the fee rate gets and how the UTXO size continues growing in the long term, it lets those custodial businesses 
be very efficient with how they're managing um, their use of chain space and the UTXO set. And so I think this is a, a pretty good thing going forward in terms of like giving those types of businesses more tools to not externalize their costs onto the network. Whew. All right. And I think Shinobi is done with his long technical rants for the day. And I will begin with a long rant from uh, a person who has a lot going on in her life. Um, if you haven't been following the Assange case in the last couple of months, um, basically uh, a judge, well, the main judge involved in the UK hearings decided to basically dox uh, his family and... Um, I mean, there was a period of a few weeks where it, it was kind of seeming like it was going to go that way, but they weren't sure. And then uh, basically she was, for, she being his um, current partner and fiance, um, was forced basically to dox herself so that, you know, the UK media, as horrible as it is, wouldn't have the main advantage uh, once her name was public because of this asshole judge. And so she's actually joined, I'm not going to say her name because I, I feel like it's a terrible thing that she had to do this, but she is with her real name on social media now, so you'll be able to find it if you look for um, any text from the article I'm going to read, but basically she published a article in uh, one of the media outlets that I've been following because they've been keeping track of the ongoing case in Spain regarding uh, UC Global and the connections to the CIA regarding the surveillance on Assange and the embassy. And so I'm going to read um, a portion of that because I think it's really important. It's kind of amazing, like, I mean, outside of a few jerks at The Guardian, which they were already jerks before this, but outside of a few jerks at The Guardian and some other nasty not-journalists, um, basically all of the people who were saying really nasty things about Hassange have kind of quieted. Like, the ones that have been doing it for years on and off just making snippy comments, they've gone really quiet now that they know that he has a partner and they have children together and they, those children are going to look back potentially on what these people said about their father when he was being persecuted by multiple states and be like, wow, what kind of person are you to be talking about my father this way when he was in this situation? Um, so they've gone a lot more quiet now. Um, and so I'm just going to read what... Um, his fiance wrote in the article, um, she starts off with, uh, the life of my partner Julian Assange is at severe risk. He is on remand at HP, HMP Belmarsh and COVID-19 is spreading within its walls. Julian and I have two little boys. Since becoming a mother, I have been reflecting on my own childhood. Um, I'm kind of, you know, it's a very long piece, so I've cut out the most important parts. And at this part, she writes about her experience as um, a child in South Africa under apartheid and escaping that. And so she said, I've absorbed my parents' vivid memories of the raid. Um, if that terrible night shaped my perspective of the world, the incarceration of the father of my children will surely mark theirs. The image of Julian being carried out of the embassy shocked many. It struck a blow to my chest, but it did not shock me. What happened that morning was an extension of what had been going on inside the embassy over an 18-month period. And then she goes on to detail how she was individually targeted, how her family was targeted, her children were t literally targeted um, as babies. They were targeted by the surveillance operations that were at the embassy. And also how the, uh, a lawyer was targeted as well. Um, and so she ends with, I want our children to grow up with the clarity of conviction that I had as a little girl. Peril lay beyond the South African border. I want them to believe that inequitable treatment is not tolerated in mature democracies. Julian needs to be released now for him, for our family, and for the society we all want our children to grow up in. Yeah, I think that finding out about his kids and his new family just adds a whole new dimension of fucked up to all of this. 
Yeah, and like I said, she details some of the really screwed up things that were done towards her and the children. One of them was that um, actually one of the staff members at the embassy, I can't remember if it was, I think it was an embassy staff, but it might have also been a staff at the UC Global or one of the other security companies there. But basically, um, they tried to steal a diaper um, from the, I think it was the first child. They tried to steal a diaper so that they could DNA test it to see whether it was one of Jillian's children because literally they they try they actually made efforts to not make it obvious that these were his children they whenever uh, she visited him at the embassy uh, when she was when she was pregnant she would actually con she tried to conceal the fact that she was pregnant and then after the baby was born they actually had a friend of theirs bring the child in so it was just like oh yeah this is you know this is just a friend and here, oh look, his cute kid. Um, so they were trying to obscure the fact that they were partners and that there was a child involved to some degree, but obviously with the amount of surveillance that was going on and that you had literally people who were stealing diapers, um, you can't conceal that for long. So the intelligence agencies have probably known about this for a long time, but the fact that, you know, a judge for no good there was no public interest reason to make any of their identities public um the fact that she did that i mean now everyone knows like the public knows she's going to get harassed her children are going to get harassed um for you know po potentially the rest of their lives and yeah this this is what they had to pay so at the very least, you know, they had to sacrifice their privacy in order to, like, now she's actually, admirably, she's taken this um, opportunity to, you know, she had to get her privacy violated, but she's using it as an opportunity to speak out about the fact that, hey, this guy has a family, what you're doing to him, I mean, whether or not he has a family, what you're doing to him is fucked up, but he has children now, is this really what you want to teach these children who are going to presumably grow up in the UK or some other country nearby, is this the lesson you want to teach them? They, you know, they're going to potentially lose their father if you continue with this persecution. Yeah, they're like, they're pretty much running out of time to be able to continue this uh, without it just blowing up in their face. I don't really know what else to say besides that. Yeah, it's definitely something that kind of leaves you speechless every time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Uh, you want to jump into final thoughts and wrap it for the day? Um, I will look for one if you have one to go ahead of me. Um, shit. Shit, I had a troll and I forgot it. Damn it. Oh yeah. Um so given the economic catastrophe facing the world right now and the tight financial spot that people find themselves in, I would just like to discuss a new bit proposal for miners to forgive transaction fees until the end of coronavirus. I, I really think that it's the right thing to do. And it is the best way to help people out of this crisis. All right. <laughs> uh, so my final thought, um, I don't know if it's a real birthday or not. It might be fake, but Mr. Hoddle seemed to say that it was his birthday yesterday. So happy birthday. You goofy non-privacy having fuck. I had a birthday last year, and at the end of this year, I'll tell you that I had one this year, too. Yeah, strangely, I also had a birthday. <laughs> Alrighty. But yeah, I think that, that's a wrap for the day. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Catch you later, punks. I'll feed her soon.